All right, all right. Welcome to church, everybody. Can I start off with some really encouraging news? It's like there are people walking into church today, every campus. You got shorts on, t shirts. You didn't even grab a jacket on the way out of the house. But on my weather app, it says that it's going to snow next Saturday. It does so. It says snow. It's fine. We've been praying all morning. It's going to change the sun by the end of the day. Um, <laughs> that sucks. Man, I'm so done with it, you know, just over it. Sorry, I probably shouldn't say sucks in church, but may not be the worst thing I say today. So, uh, if we've never met before, um, my name's Jonathan. My wife Natasha and I are the pastors at this church. There's nobody better coming. It's just me. You've got me all day and probably next week and the week after too, so that's, that's it. You're stuck with us. Uh, we love... Uh, being here and being on team, and we got campuses around the city. So from the south, let's just welcome our north campus, our downtown campus, our family, Fort McMurray. We're in it together, and uh, we love it. We love that that's the way it is. And uh, I, I want you to start. We're going to continue our next level series if you've got a Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 1. That's sort of, there's a couple of verses in there that we're using as the launch pad or the springboard for our conversations over these few weeks. Um, so you can flip there, you can scroll there, you can follow along at this, on the screen in your location. If you want to get an old school paper Bible, we've got them at the info bar at every campus and we'll hook you up for free. Oh, free. If it's free, it's for me. Okay. That's my motto. All right. Ephesians, I don't know what that means. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. So this is a guy named Paul writing to a church that he started in a place called Ephesus. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I just want you to know this. That's what he's saying. So you may know him, that's God, better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his uncomparably great power for us who believe. This power, everybody say power. power. Say it like you're powerful. Power. power. Come on. This power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. One more time, every location. Just say power. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you're here. We ask you to speak to our hearts today in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, we've been kind of using a video game vibe to make a connection to this series and the idea of going to the next level, leveling up. Most video games have some component of going to the next level in them. And what I've realized is I've been brought back to my teenage self and been considering video games more in the last couple of weeks. I realized now, before you get offended, <laughs> you know, I say that because somebody will get offended. So I'm just giving you a warning. Um, I, I've, I'm realizing that the sort of like the better you are at video games, the worse you probably are at life. <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. Somebody just, no, no. Well, if you're defending yourself, it's probably true. Um, no, but really, like, like how well you do in a game is sort of inversely proportional to how well you're doing at life. Like, um, oh, you're moving up in the leaderboard for kills on Fortnite. Congratulations on moving back in with your mom. You know, it's the same. You can't really separate the two. I don't even know too much about video games, but like you're, oh, you, you've become a really powerful wizard in World of Warcraft. How's your body odor? Probably strong. It's just not, there's just things that aren't working out for you well, if, if that's the case. And, um, you know, am I judging you? Um, yeah, I am. And it's only because, only because, listen, there's a few things here. One, I don't understand current gaming culture. When I played video games, there was not a chance that you could turn that into a career. Now there's people who are gaming and making money, so all the power to you. Um, I just decided to get married. And so that was my, was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a girlfriend. But it wasn't that easy. Um, when I was 15, I was, I, I'd like to consider myself a bit of a gamer. I had things that, that went with being a gamer. What is that now? That's 10, is that 25 years ago? 
Good God. <laughs> wow. This got depressing in a hurry. Um, uh, but if, anyways, I'm just going to leave it. Um, but, you know, so my game, was, there's a few things that made you a gamer um, when I was 15. One was a mullet, greasy. That was just, just par for the course. Uh, two, you couldn't, you couldn't online game. We didn't even have the internet at my house. And so you had to have real people over to your house to game with them. So it was easier to waste your life because you knew you weren't wasting it alone. You're wasting it with somebody else. And, uh, but that season of my life, man, it was, I lived on a steady diet of, of Coke and 29 cent cheeseburgers and pizza. That was it. And so people would come over. We'd play video games all night. And so as you can imagine, um, just great figure, fantastic complexion given my diet. And uh, there, just, there just was a moment when I was like, man, I don't think this has taken me anywhere, especially not into the presence of a female. So I had to make some changes. I'm so glad that my wife didn't meet me at 15. How many of you just glad that your spouse didn't meet you at a certain season? I'm glad she didn't meet me at 15. She would have not been interested. One, because she would have been 11, and that's weird. Um, two, it's, it's kind of creepy. Two, because she just what I just wasn't ready for her yet. I had to change some things. And and as I've been thinking about this, this idea, how, how, again, for some people, not everybody, but for some people, the, the better you are at games, gaming, the worse you are at life. Um, the truth of going to the next level in our lives is that if you try to go to the next level spiritually, if you try to get ahead and get fulfilled and be satisfied in your own strength, you can try as hard as you possibly can. At the end of the day, you'll end up moving backwards, not forwards, when you try to level up in your own strength. And, and when the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, he's writing to a church who's in a situation like we are, asking questions like we ask. Things like, okay, so I, I understand Jesus, but what do I do now? What does it mean to follow him? How do I live like Jesus? What, what am I supposed to do now that I've come to church and for many of us, you know, made a decision to, to, to follow Jesus with our lives. And they knew there was more. They just didn't know how to level up. They didn't know how to get to the next level on their own. And so the Apostle Paul, almost as if he's giving a gaming guide to some old school um, cheat codes or, or explaining like we talked about last week, you know, once you find the, the warp zones in Mario and you can get to the new levels faster. I mean, he's explaining how to level up without some of the pain and heartache. And, and basically, there is a warp zone. You want to go to the next level, there is a spiritual warp zone that you and I can step into to level up in our relationship with God. And he unpacks these four things in that text that we read. The four things that we need to do, this is how we get into the warp zone, this is the warp zone, is to know God. We talked about that. We just got to know God. You got to believe in Jesus, get baptized, get into your Bible. I mean, we've got to know God. The second thing that's part of the warp zone is we need to find freedom. We're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Third thing is we need to discover our purpose. You were created by God on purpose for a purpose. You are not an accident. The God of the universe has wired you up uniquely and specifically to do things and fill a role in the building of his kingdom that nobody else can fulfill but you. And the fourth and final thing is just make a difference. We don't find out what our purpose is just to know. We find out to let it out, to let it show, to make a difference in the lives of other people, to have an impact. And so Paul, who writes this letter to these people in a place called Ephesus, as he's writing, I imagine I can almost see him thinking back to his own process of knowing God, finding freedom, discovering his purpose, and learning how to make a difference. And for Paul, when he went, before he knew Jesus, he actually went by another name, and that name was Saul. And Acts chapter 9 gives us the details on his warp zone. We can see him stepping into his warp zone, knowing God, finding freedom, discovering his purpose, and learning how to make a difference. And I want to talk specifically today about this finding freedom piece. And can I just ask you, don't miss a week of this series. If you weren't here last week, go back and listen to it. Stick with us for the next couple because if we can get these things, if we can as a church step into the warp zone together, God will be able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine in us, through us, if we level up together. Just don't miss it. Like for your own benefit, let's just not miss it. So he, he's about to unpack, we're about to see the components of his finding freedom. So it says this 
in Acts chapter 9 to get you up to speed. Saul was a bad dude. He hunted Christians down. What he didn't realize was that as he was hunting down Christians to arrest them, put them on trial, and oversee their execution, that Jesus was hunting him down because he had another plan. And I'm so thankful that when I was headed in my own way to my own destruction, away from Jesus, that Jesus was pursuing me. Never stops pursuing you. Never gave up on you. And it's so funny how we try to run from him. And you would know this if this is your story. I mean, it's been my story. You try to run from him and you think you're far enough away. Then all of a sudden, boom, he's right there again. He's right there again. He just keeps popping up. That's what happened to Saul. Saul was running from Jesus. He was persecuting the church. He's on his way to a place called Damascus to bring more death and destruction. And Jesus jumps into his journey and says, hey, Saul, not so fast. I got another plan for you. So he has this encounter. This is his no God moment. And then what we're about to see is how he goes from like knowing God, having a moment with Jesus, into finding the freedom that Christ paid for on the cross. Acts chapter 9, verse 7. It says, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. So there had been a bright light. Saul and Jesus had had a conversation. Saul's laying on the ground. So they're standing there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So he's had his no God moment. His eyes are open to the fact that he needs Jesus and needs to follow Jesus, but he can't see anything. And this is where we get some context to his letter to the church in Ephesians in Ephesus where he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. See, Saul can write that because he knows what it's like to be blind. He was blind, and so he knows, man, you've, you've got to have the eyes of your heart enlightened. Well, of course, you don't see physically with your heart, but you perceive everything with your heart. And the truth is, you and I don't see things As they are, we see them as we are. And every single person in the room today, we have got filters that we put on our heart that that determine how we see life, how we see people, how we see relationships, how we understand God. And the filters on our heart guide our emotions, our actions, our decisions, our perceptions, our identity, our faith, our relationships. All of it is influenced by your heart filter. And these filters come from our experience. Filter is really just a nice way of saying issues. What I'm trying to say in very uncertain terms, we all have issues. First one, I got issues. Um, you've, like, it's a couple people like, I don't know if I have issues. Well, that's your problem. You don't think you've, you've got issues. I'm going to invite uh, Eris. My friend Eris is going to come up. Give me a hand for a second. Everybody give a hand for Eris. Eris is an ECOG, which is probably why he he gets roped into being a prop so often. (laughs) Um, Okay, so now obviously we can't illustrate the eyes of Eris' heart because that would be a little too graphic for church on Sunday. But he has physical eyes, and I want, I want to try and I want you to see what happens when we start to add these filters from our experiences. So uh, let's see here. I've got a variety of different eyewear. Um, so Eris, I think this is not necessarily describing Eris' life per se, but he's going to be a stand-in for some of the things that we all deal with in different ways. So um, maybe, maybe Eris, you were, maybe we don't know for sure, maybe, uh, you were raised in an environment where there was heavy expectation, high expectation, you felt like you could, you don't have to agree or disagree. Okay, so, oh my God, that was me, that was me. <laughs> we'll just pray for you. Um, this is going to be good, you're just very therapeutic. Um, Raised where there's high expectations, a high standard. And sometimes, when that's the type of environment you're raised in, especially if it's a religious family with religious standards, you can feel like you always have to be perfect. And when you're not, you're constantly letting people down. And when you feel like you're constantly letting people down, what subtly happens is a filter gets put on your heart, a filter of, of failure. And so, just like, man, check these out. Man, this is a party and a half, right? Those, those look good. So you've got the filter of failure. So now... Anytime you go to do, you don't want to take risks. You always want to play it safe. You always want to do the sure thing because you're terrified of making a mistake and failing and letting somebody down. You're viewing your life through a filter of failure. Maybe, um, maybe in your family growing up, there was a moment, uh, maybe your parents divorced. 
Maybe you had a parent who kind of walked out on the family. And so what happens is um, you were too young to fully understand. And so uh, even subtly, maybe even without really knowing it, all of a sudden you, you've watched somebody that you loved and trusted walk away and you feel abandoned. And so now it's almost impossible for you to get into and stay into a meaningful relationship or to fully trust somebody because you're afraid that people who say they love you are going to leave you. You've got abandonment issues, and now there's a filter of abandonment over the eyes of your heart. Filter of abandonment. Looks good. Can you see all right? Okay, perfect. See, he's got, he's got filters. Filter of abandonment. Then maybe, maybe it's been a job thing for you. Like maybe you got overlooked for a promotion. Maybe a boss talked down to you. Maybe somebody else got elevated before you did. Maybe you got laid off. Maybe you lost a job. And, and so because of that, you're actually harboring some rejection. You know, you're not good enough. You don't belong. And so all of a sudden, you've got a filter of rejection over the eyes of your heart. Some, oh, nice fit. There we go. Those are mine. Well used because I'm so handy. <laughs> Other than that, I just can't paint straight. Um, maybe, maybe when you were young, your parents had a hard time bonding with you emotionally. And so there's always been a void because you never had that close, intimate relationship with your parents. And so you're looking for emotional connection. And that pursuit takes you into your teens and your 20s to decisions that you regret. And so now, because you've been searching, you actually have a filter of, of well, let's put those up there like that, filter of shame. Filter of shame over your life. Maybe you got cut from a sports team. Maybe you suffered abuse. Maybe you've got a filter of fear. Maybe you've prayed and prayed and prayed for God to do a miracle in your life, and it hasn't happened. Maybe you prayed for somebody to, to get healed, and they didn't. And all of a sudden, it's not just fear and anxiety. You've got a filter of disappointment and disillusionment and unbelief, not just even in yourself, but in God. And now your life is full of filters. And, and, and we end up just like Saul. So, Eris, you got your eyes open? Yep. Can you see? Okay. Eyes open? No vision. Just like Saul. Man, you, you've got your eyes open. You know that Jesus loved you and died for you, but you're frustrated because you still can't see where you're going. You can't see past your issues. You can't see into your freedom. And for so many of us, this is how we live our emotional and spiritual lives. We get so filtered with our negative experiences that to move forward is only like we're weak and we're timid. We're unsure. We're insecure. We're full of fear. And I want to be very clear. This Finding freedom isn't a heaven and hell issue for most people. His eyes are open to the fact that Jesus loves him and died for him, but he cannot see into his future. Freedom is not about eternity. It's about destiny. It's not about what you're going to do someday in the distant future when we've died and we've moved on from this life. It's about making the most of the moments you have at your disposal right now. It's about not wasting one more day being afraid, not wasting one more moment being full of doubt, not wasting one more day allowing the abuse from your past to determine the quality of life in the present. It's about the quality of life you have the ability to possess right now. Right now, you don't have to wait until you get to heaven. Jesus promised, man, that we could be so free that you and I would have the ability to bring heaven to earth. And so we want to be enlightened. The eyes of our heart be enlightened. To be enlightened, sorry about your hair, is to be informed, to have our outlook illuminated, and to be spiritually aware. Jesus wants us not just to be free from our sin, but to be free from our issues. Give it up for Eris. Say thank you. Hey, and so freedom is for everybody. There are some people in the room today watching from your campus, and you, you've heard this thought before, but you've never believed it's for you. It's for someone who's more religious than me, for someone who's more committed than me, for someone who's been in it long. No, no, no. Freedom is for everybody. Saul just got knocked off his donkey onto his butt, had an encounter with Jesus, and we're going to see immediately the freedom process starts. Here's how it unfolds. He's blind. 
He's, he's laying on the ground. His friends start to lead him towards Damascus. Well, he's on his way. God speaks to a man named Ananias in Damascus. We don't, we don't know very much about Ananias except that he was a believer and he said yes to God. So you want to do great things for God, you just need to believe in Jesus and say yes when God asks you to do something. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a theologian. He wasn't an evangelist. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a teacher. He was a regular person who believed in Jesus and said yes when God asked. He says yes, and God says, okay, I love this, because God will try and get your yes before he gives you the details. And so Ananias says yes, and then God starts to give him the details. He said, okay, here's the deal. Uh, Saul is on his way into town. He's blind. He's going to go to this house on this street. I want you to find him, place your hands on him, pray for him, and, 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 and you're going to minister to Saul. Well, as soon as God gives the details, like so many of us do, Ananias is like, whoa! Like, understand, Ananias is a Christian in the city that Saul was on his way to, to arrest and then oversee the execution of Christians. So, God, God, you got to be kidding. Saul, me and my family, we've been hiding out from Saul. Now, you want me to, to like, go. To, I've been hiding from him. You're telling me to go to where he is and not even go to where he is. You want me to, you want me to touch him. Do you want to put my hands on him? Okay, God, let me, so you said he's blind. How blind is he? Color blind? Can he see shapes? Is he going to know I'm coming? When you say lay hands on him, like how forceful are we talking? Can I use a blunt object? Can that be a sucker punch? Like, God, just give me some parameters. God says, you've got to go. I've chosen him, and even though you can't see the potential, I see it, and you're about to unlock it. Just go. And then here's what happens. Three things that are part of Saul's freedom journey that if we would step into these three things, I'm convinced from Scripture that you and I would experience the same type of freedom that he's about to see. Acts chapter 9, verse 17. It says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who has appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Three things that happen in these verses, and I, I, honestly, as I've been digging into them, I feel like they're changing my life all over again. Three things. Number one, and uh, there might be, my wife said that I gave four sets of three points in the first service. I'm going to try and slow that down a little bit for you, but it's still not bad to take some notes, okay? Number one, Ananias shows up. You just got to get with the right people. That's the point. You want to be free? You've got to have the right people in your corner. See, because it's impossible to be free if you're hanging out with people that have all the same issues you have. You want to be free? You need to get more of the right people in your life. You need some people who are running hard after Jesus. You need some people who are running hard after freedom. You need some people who can call you to another level. It is impossible to get free solo. The devil wants you to think. That you can get free just by getting on your knees and having a moment with Jesus. You can get saved that way. You don't get free that way. You can go to heaven that way. That's just you and Jesus. But you need other people if you're truly going to be free. So, so he's got to get the right people around him. The second thing, once you've got the right people around you, you need to be transparent. You need to be vulnerable. Think about this for a minute. Saul's been blind for three days. Blind is new to him. He's not mastered the stick. He doesn't know how to read Braille. He's not comfortable being a blind man. Yet he's sitting in a stranger's house, not knowing what the heck is going on in his life, totally blind, no doubt, a little bit of insecure, insecurity. He's probably unsure. And a man that he's never met before walks into the room and says, hey, God sent me. And then he puts his hands on him. I don't like put people putting their hands on me when I see you coming. How vulnerable does Saul have to be to just sit there and trust that even though this believer knows that Saul was coming to kill them and take them out, Saul's willing to not defend himself, not run, not protect himself, but to be vulnerable enough to say, I need you and I need you to place your hands on me. Vulnerability. You've got to be vulnerable. Again, it's not enough to have the right people. You've got to say the right things. You've got to be transparent. There's some people in the room. And listen, so you've got to get in a group. If you feel stuck and you're not free, if you're not in a group, it's really hard to help you get around the right people. But you can be in the right group and still not have the right posture. See, Saul had to be vulnerable. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, confess your sins. I love this. Not to God, but to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
There is something that happens when we are transparent and vulnerable with one another where God actually brings healing to the issues. He'll start to pull off the filters from your heart when you're with the right people and you decide to be vulnerable. I've got this in my life. Every single Friday morning, every Friday morning, I have a conversation with a friend and he's, he's my friend, and we, we confess issues. There are areas that I'm still contending for freedom. And so when we talk, it's like, hey, man, have you been free in that area this week? How can I pray for you? Where did you slip up? What can I do? Talk to me about how you've been thinking. He asks me the same questions back and forth. Why? Because I need somebody in my life who's contending with me for my freedom. So he finds the right people. He decides to be transparent and vulnerable. And the third thing, it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. What or who is the Holy Spirit? If you go back to the Old Testament, you'd see that the way people related to God in the Old Testament, he was God over creation. He created, but then he spoke and communicated through individual prophets selected one at a time to be his mouthpiece. He's over everything. That wasn't intimate enough for God. So he sent his son Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus shows up in the Gospels and all of a sudden it's not God over us, it's God with us. People could interact with him, understand him, watch him move and speak and teach, know that he understands our emotions and how we feel like he's God with us, but that wasn't good enough. There was another level of intimacy, and so God sent Jesus. Then Jesus sent the Spirit, and after he died on the cross and rose from the grave, it wasn't God over us or God with us. It became God in us through the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, that you and I have the power of the living God inside of us says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. This is Jesus telling them about what's to come. He says, on one occasion, could be this particular Sunday in May at Experience Church, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, listen, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But this is what you do need to know. You will receive power. Say power. power. Come on, say it like you're powerful. Power. power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, listen, you're saved already. But you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Baptized. Just means to be all in. You're going to be all in with the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Think about it like this. I could fill this water bottle. This is like salvation. I get filled up on salvation. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is like taking this water bottle with water inside of it and throwing it into a pool. All of a sudden, it's not just in me. I'm in him. Is a different thing. I don't want to live just with only with him in me. I want to be in him. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to walk out of this place and walk in him. Because you know what? He's got some attributes that I need. I want to leave here. I want to walk in power. I want to walk in confidence. I want to walk in freedom, in joy, in hope, in healing, in peace. We can walk in those things because we can be totally baptized in him. In him. You'll receive power. I mean, who doesn't want power? Everybody wants power, but power for what? Power just means ability. And so if it's power that comes from God, we have to conclude that it's supernatural ability, divine enablement. It's boldness. It's confidence to talk about what Jesus has done in your life. It's, it's divine enablement. Paul said this about himself. I don't preach with wise and persuasive words, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit, a demonstration of his power. What does that mean? That means that what Jesus did, you can do. You can pray for people to get healed, and they're going to get healed. You can believe for miracles and see miracles. You can invite people to church, and they might just come. It's the the explosive power of God, not just in you, but being released through you when you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us deal with our issues. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. The only way I can stay free is to have the Holy Spirit empowering me in my weak moments. 
helps us stay free. Not only that, um, it's Romans 15, 13 says that we have the overflow of hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. It gives you hope in a hopeless world. It gives you the fullness of God available in your life. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. All of these things are available through one source. It's the Holy Spirit. That's it. You, you, can't, you can try to have those things on your own, but you'll get stressed out, frustrated, and exhausted. You need the Holy Spirit to enable you to live this type of life. And, and, and I just want to be really, I want to be transparent with you for a minute. In the last few weeks, I've heard God saying something to me over and over and over again. Not audibly, but it's, it's clearer than I've heard him speak to me in years, really since the beginning of this church. And, and he said to me, and I, just, I remember it so, like, just so clearly, he said, if you would make room for my spirit, I'll do things you can't do. If you make room, if you make room for the spirit, and immediately I started to think, God, have we not? And he said, no, you haven't. You've been thinking that if the lights are right, if the sermon's good, if the music's nice, if the coffee's hot, if you raise enough money, you've been, you've been thinking that if you do all those things, then great things will happen. You can do all those things. If you don't have the spirit, it's not supernatural. And so as, as the pastor and leader of this church, I would be doing you a disservice to continue to try and inspire you towards a different kind of life without giving you the fuel required to live a different kind of life. It's not just about understanding how to break our habits and how to have relationships and how to get close to Jesus. No, no, no. There's more to it than that. There's a purpose on you that you will never fulfill unless you are divinely empowered by the Holy Spirit. The, the, if, aside from giving my life to Jesus and knowing that my eternity is secure, it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that has made the difference in my existence. Without the Holy Spirit, I probably wouldn't be faithful in my marriage. Without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't be able to father and be a good dad to my kids. Without the Holy Spirit, I'd have no ability to lead. Without the Holy, I mean, he does everything. The Holy Spirit is my weapon against discouragement, my weapon against spiritual attack, my weapon against loneliness and fatigue and temptation. I mean, it is the Holy Spirit that sustains me. And I apologize for every week that we've sent you out the doors thinking that somehow in your own strength you can live the life God has called you to. You will fail every single time, 10 times out of 10. You will drop, you will fall short without the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. Every time. And, and this is the thing, the devil doesn't want you to have this type of ammunition. He, he, wants, he wants you to be sent into battle without bullets for your gun. See, because he knows, oh, you're saved. Your eyes are opened. You're going to go to heaven. He might not be able to destroy you, but he's going to try to disarm you because you're dangerous when you're free. And if he can take the bullet out of your gun, then he knows what's happened inside of you is not going to spread to other people. And so, so we need to be aware of the way that he tries to disarm us. He doesn't want you to fight for who you were meant to be. But the fight's on. Let's go. We're going to fight today. Couple, re couple ways the, the devil tries to distract us and disarm us. One, just bad intel. Maybe you're here and you, you didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Listen, that's not even on you. That's on me. There's a Holy Spirit. I'm telling you right now, he's got a beautiful plan for your life. There's a story in Acts chapter 19. A whole bunch of people have been saved. Paul shows up to see how things are going in this new church. And he found some, found some disciples and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we didn't even know there was such a thing. And then they prayed and took care of it. They told them all about the Holy Spirit. They were on their way to frustration, trying to live saved but not empowered. The second reason, maybe you didn't know. Maybe it's just been bad theology. Maybe somewhere in your upbringing somebody told you that miracles and signs and wonders and supernatural healing and the power of God inside of you, baptizing the Holy Spirit, flowing out of you and making a difference was just for the apostles in the early church. You can believe that if you want to, but it's wrong. It's not true. You know how I know? Because my life depends on the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's been overemphasized to the point where somebody has made you think, hey, if you don't have a certain expression of the Holy Spirit, if it doesn't happen like this in your life, then you're not even saved. That's not true either. Jesus saves us by grace, not, not by works, lest any man should boast. It has nothing to do with what you do. It's all grace. 
So you don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit for eternity. Like I said, you need it for your destiny. You need it for your today. Some of us, it's just bad packaging. I admit, I mean, the minute I started talking about the Holy Spirit, you're like, this is weird. I shouldn't have come. I should not have brought my mom. This is weird. It's a cult. This is weird. (laughs) Does anybody remember colored ketchup? Wow, somebody liked it. That's disgusting. No judgment. Judgment free zone. I remember when like colored ketchup came out. I had a little brother, and so um, we shifted for a little bit from like your your red ketchup to the green stuff. And then they, Heinz was making like purple ketchup with sparkles and all these different things. And man, I could not get over. Like I tried. There's something about dipping your French fry in something slimy and green, and then putting it into your mouth. It just doesn't work. I tried it with my eyes closed, but I knew it was green. I could not. It tasted the same, but I could not make it work. That experiment only lasted a couple of years because people couldn't get past the packaging. Same taste, but the way it looked caused them to reject the taste. And that's the same way it is for a lot of us with our experiences with the Holy Spirit. We've seen things that seem so weird that we're rejecting him altogether when really it's just been a packaging problem. Maybe you're up late one night and you saw some TV preacher talking about the Holy Spirit asking for money. You don't have to pay money for the Holy Spirit. Free gift. Maybe you grew up in an environment where it was kind of crazy. You've been exposed to some things. People saying it's the Holy Spirit and they're shaking and they're falling or there's, you know, gold dust, people barking like dogs. I don't know. I'm just trying to cover the spectrum. I grew up in a really, call it Pentecostal, charismatic, believed in the Holy Spirit church. It was so fun because on Sundays, you'd have to check for a pulse. So I'll just stand there singing hymns. I wore, everybody, I was an usher. I wore a suit. It was like at 13, I was crushing a suit nearly every week. Your boy looked good. But man, Sunday nights, we'd roll up to church. I had our Pentecostal survival kit. It was Sunday night service, everything. The ladies let their hair down, took off their hats. It was wild on Sunday nights. I'd have like, uh, you know, you'd got non-perishable food items and coloring sheets to last a week in case something happened and church went long. You know, you just, you prep for it. It was different. But I reached this moment in my life where I was like, God, I don't care what anybody else's experience has been. I don't care what the packaging has looked like. I don't want my expectations to be tainted by what somebody else has experienced, good or bad. I just want what the Bible says. And the Bible says, don't leave Jerusalem. Don't leave this place of encounter. Don't leave the place that you met Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't go into battle without your ammo. Don't go without the power coming out of you. It's essential. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 4, it says, Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What does that mean? Your problems are spiritual. Oh, I know. There might be some habits, some triggers, some some physical side effects, but your problems are spiritual. The problem in the Garden of Eden wasn't just that the apple looked good and tasted good. It was spiritual. Something was happening to try and separate Adam and Eve from God. It's spiritual. Addiction is spiritual. Lust is spiritual. Anger is spiritual. It's all spiritual. Anything that can separate you from Jesus is a spiritual problem. We live in a world that has spiritual problems. Your life has spiritual problems. And the only way to encounter and interact and overcome a spiritual problem is with a spiritual power. You keep trying to go to battle in spiritual battles without spiritual power. You will get frustrated. You will get overwhelmed. You'll feel defeated. You'll want to give up. You'll get distracted. You'll get weary. You'll throw in the towel. Come on, we need spiritual power if we're going to win. Saul was blind. He was broken. He had no vision. He's walking in the dark. Eyes open, can't see. Like so many of us, eyes open, but we're stumbling towards our destiny. We're not making any ground. Jesus has freedom for you today. But he doesn't just have it for you today. He's got the Holy Spirit to empower your life so you can be free tomorrow, and you can be free Tuesday, and you can be free Wednesday and Thursday. No, he's got freedom for you. It says that Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice the word filled, because God will never force anything on you that you don't want. 
but he's filled. Why? Because if we would make space for the Holy Spirit in our lives, he will fill you with so much power and so much confidence and so much boldness. It will not just change your life. It'll change the life of everybody you come in contact with. There's more. There's a next level. So what do we do? How do we receive the baptism of the, how do we go all in with the Holy Spirit? Number one, we've got to remove barriers. The minute you decide to follow Jesus, you say no to the barriers and yes to the blessing of having a Savior. And I want to take a moment, if you're here in this room or at any of our locations and you don't have a relationship, we're not done yet, we're going to be done in a few minutes, but we need to take a moment right here. I'm going to ask everybody just for a minute, would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads with me downtown, north campus? Let's just close our eyes together. Nobody move. There are some people in the room right now. God is speaking to your heart. He's calling you into relationship right now. Because you can't do this on your own. You can't make it on your own. You can't live free on your own. You need Jesus who paid the price for your sins on the cross. So I'm going to invite you to believe. I'm going to count to three. And if you've never made the decision just to believe that he died for you and believe that he has a future for you, but you're making that decision today, you slip up your hand. That's it. That's all I'm asking you to do. Here we go. One, you know you need Jesus. Stop rejecting him. Stop walking away. Two, three, slip up your hand. Everybody, thank you so much in the south. Thank you in the south campus, north campus, downtown. We see your hands. You can put your hands down. That's great. Maybe you made that decision today with a raised hand. Maybe you made it in your heart. I'm going to ask you to repeat this very simple prayer after me. EC, let's say it together. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Forgive me from my sins. Come into my heart. Amen. Amen. Listen, so, so the first thing is we've got to remove the barriers. The second thing is we need to ask for it. And we're going, to take, we're going to ask for it collectively as a church right now. We've even picked a song that says, Come Holy Spirit. You don't even have to think about what to say. You sing along. That's an invitation to the power of the Holy Spirit to invade your everyday life. Number three, we just receive it by faith. You don't have to work for this. You don't have to pay for this. You don't have to be perfect for this. You just got to be available for this. You just receive it. And then don't just make it a Sunday thing. Relate to him daily. Try it this week. When you wake up, add this line to your prayer. Holy Spirit, I need you today. I've been trying this the last few, several weeks. It's been changing my life. To just wake up and say, I can't do today by myself. Holy Spirit, I need you. That simple. Make it part of your daily life. Make it part of your every day. I'm, I'm going to ask you. We're going to pray together as a church. I'm going to ask you at every location. Nobody leave. Everybody stand to your feet just for a moment. I believe that there's something happening in the room right now. The Holy Spirit is stirring something up in the room right now. Listen, it might not all make sense to your natural mind. If I'm being honest, it doesn't make sense perfectly to my natural mind either. But God didn't call me to live a natural life. He created me to live a supernatural life. And so I just want what he has. I want what the Bible says. I want the power that's inside of me to be seen on the outside. I want to pray for people and watch them get healed. I believe that we're not called just to be supernatural people. We're going to be a supernatural church. And so we're not just going to walk out of this room. We're going to walk into life with the Holy Spirit. We're going to walk into joy and into hope and into freedom and into forgiveness and into miracles. and into. We're going to walk into it on a different level. So if you're ready for the power of the Holy Spirit, in your life. Would you lift your hands all across the room? We're just going to sing this chorus out. Jesus, you see our hands. God, we're desperate. We can't do it in our own ability. We can't do it in our own strength. God, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. Come on, let's sing.